know? Yeah. <laughs> so let's get started. Today's machine learning and friends uh, lunch speaker is Nima Hamidi, who's joining us from Stanford University. Nima is a PhD student in statistics, and his interests include multi arm bandit experiments and low rank matrix estimation. And today's talk is titled On Worst Case Regret of Linear Thompson Sampling. Uh, just a couple of logistics questions. Um, if, uh, if you have um, a question for our speaker, feel free to unmute at a judicious point and um, interrupt. And if it gets too chaotic, we'll figure it out as we go along. Uh, but let's all unmute and welcome uh, Nima to UMass. Thank you so much for joining us, Nima. Thank you. Okay, so can I start? Um, and can you see my slides or? Okay, good. So hello everyone. And um, so my name is Nima and I'm so glad to be here. And um, my talk is about the worst case regret of an algorithm called Thompson sampling for stochastic linear bandits. And this is joint work with my uh, advisor Mohsen Bayati. So this is going to be um, the structure of the talk. So I will first uh, define the problem, uh, the stochastic linear bandit problem. And then I will present some algorithms that <clears throat> basically um, aim at solving this problem using confidence sets. So I'm, I'm going to call them confidence-based policies. And then I'm going to show that one of these algorithms that, um, that is very popular called linear Thompson sampling actually fails uh, and this is uh, you know a, basically um, most people believe that it, it works but actually we will show that in some cases it can fail and then i will try to if we have time i will try to show that using our you know our ideas we can uh, somehow uh, get some similar bounds in, in under some stronger conditions so now let's start um, with the with the setting um, so Okay, I'm going to define a stochastic linear bandit problem here. So in a, in, in a linear bandit problem, we have a fixed vector theta star in RD. This is fixed, but this is unknown. Uh, and so the algorithm doesn't know theta star. And at any time, little t, an action set AT, which is a subset of RD is shown to the algorithm or policy. And I'm going to denote a policy with P. And then the goal is that in this, uh, and then the goal is that the algorithm should choose one of these actions like a tilde, and then it observes some reward which is given, use, given by this formula. So it's just the inner product of your action, the chosen action and, and the vector of unknowns plus some probably sub Gaussian noise, uh, which has mean zero. And so, so this is the, the setup. So the algorithm initially doesn't know theta star, but as it uh, you know, basically uh, observes more and more uh, rewards, then it can learn some, some stuff about uh, this theta star. And so it can increase the, you know, its rewards in, in the subsequent rounds. Um, so there is a uh, notion that we use to, to see how uh, well an algorithm performs. And, uh, and of course, again, as I, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the goal is to finding algorithms that improve themselves using the past experiences. And so the, the, the metric that we use to evaluate uh, an algorithm is called regret. And so if you look at this, this is basically at time t, small t, uh, basically this supremum is the maximum reward that the algorithm uh, can get at time t. And this is the, the mean uh, reward that it gets by, by choosing this action. And so we sum this up from time one to capital T and we call this capital T the time horizon. And, um, and so we basically compute this expectation uh, so the nice thing about this is that for some algorithms, we can show that this grows sublinearly in terms of T. And so those algorithms are basically, uh, I, I will show some, some, some examples. And this expectation, uh, there are so many different sources of randomness in this expectation. So one source is of course, the randomness in, 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 the, no in the noise um, realizations. Another source can be in the action set. So the action set can be also random. 
And uh, also, it also takes into account the randomness inside the algorithm. So we can have a randomized algorithm that basically flips a coin to, to make a decision. However, here we assume that theta star is like a fixed vector. So here theta star is not random. Um, now there is, a, there is another notion called uh, the Bayesian regret, which is defined when theta star is also random. And so we assume that there is a, we have a prior distribution. And so we sample theta star from that distribution in advance, and then we run our experiment using that. And then in this case, we can uh, basically uh, define the Bayesian regret to be the expected regret when this theta star is sampled from that distribution. Okay, so um, now I'm going to talk about the algorithms. If there's any questions, you know, about the setting, this is the best time to ask. Okay. So the first algorithm that I'm going to talk about is called greedy. And greedy works as, as follows. So we always have a set of, you know, past observations. And so greedy basically, uh, Con constructs you know, an estimate theta hat for theta star. And then it chooses the action that maximizes this, this inner product. So basically grid, the idea behind grid is that treat theta hat as if it were the, the vector of true parameters and see what action is optimal and then choose that action. So in this figure, you can, this is basically shows how greedy works. So we have a, a past you know, history and then we use that to estimate theta store, and then we, we make a greedy decision because of this, uh, based on that theta store, and then we observe some reward, and we add that new reward and um, uh, chose an action to, to the history. So here I haven't, uh, I didn't say how we compute this theta hat, but uh, in this talk, we will only use like rich estimator. And this is the, the closed form solution for the rich estimator. Uh, this VT is also important and I'm going to, uh, you know, use it over and over. So this is basically like how much, uh, this is a D by D positive semi-definite matrix. And in a way, in a sense, it actually just captures how much information we have about each direction. So if we explore, you know, one direction a lot, then this VT will be like, uh, will be large in that, that specific direction. So uh, yeah, so now I can write greedy algorithm using this notation. So at time uh, little t, we pull the arm that maximizes uh, this inner product. And then we observe uh, the reward, you know, RT that is generated using the formula that I showed before. And then we update VT and theta hat t in using, the, using those formulas. And then we go back to, the, to line two. So unfortunately, greedy doesn't work in the sense that its uh, regret can grow linearly in terms of t, and this is uh, because of you know the the estimation error that can happen. And there are two types of estimation errors that can happen. One is like overestimating the reward of an action or underestimating the reward of an action. Usually, overestimating is not a big deal because if you overestimate the reward of an action, then you tend to choose that, that action. And after you, you choose it, you have one new observation and that's an opportunity to correct that, that estimation error. But underestimation in this literature is a very huge uh, problem because if you underestimate the reward of one, one of your actions, then probably you won't take it. And if you don't take it, you don't get new observations and, do, and that, boy, and that uh, uh, estimation error won't uh, you know, change in the next round. And so basically you can fail to find the optimal arm forever if you don't have, a, uh, if you don't have an exploration mechanism. So there is an algorithm, uh, okay, and, and before I uh, get to the next algorithm, let's, let's look at, um, so in this plot, this is actually, I wanna pause on this a little bit. So assume that we have five actions, A1 to A5, and assume that these dots here are our uh, empirical means for the reward of these actions. So we have, all, we have um, uh, basically taken some several actions in the past and we have came up with those uh, estimates. 
And then when we look at the inner product of A1 and, and that theta hat, this will be like our um, uh, basically values. And, and these confidence intervals are using basically that VT to say how much uncertainty we have each of these arms. So what really says is that just pull the, just take the action or pull the arm, you know, I, I use the, these things interchangeably, uh, choose the action that has highest means. So it would, it would basically choose this action, right? Because it has, its, its center point is above all the other ones. Now I'm going to talk about another algorithm called OFUL or optimism in face of uncertainty um, algorithm. Um, so the idea here is that in order to overcome that underestimation issue, the idea is, is that um, is to be optimistic in estimating the reward of an action. So instead of looking at the center points, it, this algorithm basically suggests to look at the upper confidence bound. So, um, okay, so, and so we, we first need to uh, define a, you know, our confidence sets. And first of all, we need to define this norm. So this, this is VT like uh, the sum of a, a transpose that we saw in the previous slides. And so it's easy to see that this is a norm. And then our confidence sets are defined as, so basically it's just like an ellipsoid center that theta hat. But the norm that we used to uh, basically look at is, is, is this norm that I'm defining here. Um, okay, so, and the nice thing is that if this row uh, or the radius of that, that ellipsoid is of order square root D, then there is a nice theorem that says that this confidence set contains uh, theta star with high probability. Um, okay, now, now, uh, Using, using this result, we can talk about, you know, this algorithm awful. And um, so basically this algorithm is similar to, uh, to greedy, but there is one, only one difference. And the difference is that instead of maximizing in order to choose an action, instead of maximizing the inner product of A and the center of the confidence set, which is the hat, this algorithm says be optimistic. And for each action, um, compute this supremum, and this supremum is with respect to the confidence set. So instead of just looking at the center point, look at all the points inside, inside that confidence set and see how much, what is the optimistic value that we could expect to get for, for action A, and choose the action that has highest uh, optimistic reward. And you can see it's easy to show that for any um, fixed A, there is a closed form solution for this supremum because this is just like a, um, um, it's easy to compute that. And, and, and it's basically like the, um, you know, this inner product of A and, and the center of that ellipsoid plus some term that only depends on that VT. Okay, now back to this, back to this figure. Now I can also tell you how these confidence intervals are constructed. So for each action, the width of the confidence interval is basically like two times this quantity. And now, uh, and now what this formula tells us is that we should choose the action that has highest, highest value in this supremum, or in other words, it, it basically the one that has highest, uh, you know, this, this one. Um, and so, here, if you look at these things, these intervals, this is the one that has highest upper confidence bound. And so OFUL basically says we should pick this one. There's another algorithm which is very popular called, called Thompson sampling, but in this case, it's, uh, we call it linear Thompson sampling because it's adapted to the linear bandit. So this algorithm uses randomization to address this underestimation problem. So basically, uh, this is a Bayesian idea in nature. So it says that, assume that there is a prior distribution over theta star and assume that you know the prior distribution as well as noise distributions. And then this algorithm is basically uh, works, as, works by basically um, computing the posterior distribution of theta star given the past observations. 
So you have a prior over theta star and you have, you have made some observations that, that are related to that theta star. So you can, if you know all the distributions, then you can compute the posterior distribution of theta star. And then uh, Thomson sampling works by sampling a vector you know, from this posterior distribution. So it doesn't know theta star, but it knows uh, its, its posterior distribution. So it samples from that. And in this argmax, it basically maximizes just this inner product between A and theta tilde. And actually it's easy to show that in many cases, in most cases, this theta tilde will belong to that, the same confidence set with high probability. And so the nice thing about this algorithm is that it says instead of solving that supremum over the entire ellipsoid, just sample from that and one random point, and then, and then uh, just solve this argmax problem. So an interesting uh, special case of this is when uh, the prior distribution is Gaussian and the noise distributions are all Gaussian. And in that case, we can see that this theta tilde or the posterior distribution follows this, you know, follows also multivariate Gaussian. And the mean is basically our, uh, our ridge estimator and our uh, covariance matrix is VT inverse. And so we can basically, uh, it, this algorithm can be implemented very efficiently and very easily. Okay. So if we want to see how Thomson sampling works in this figure, um, basically it's, it works as follows. It, it first samples you know, a point inside each confidence interval. And rather than looking at, so it doesn't actually construct confidence intervals, but, but it just assigns a random point, a random value to each, to each action, which is the inner product of A and theta tilde. And then, um, it chooses the action that has highest, you know, uh, this, this, you know, has highest cross. So in this case, I guess this one is the winner. So linear Thompson sampling would choose this one because this cross is, is above all the other ones. Okay. So if there's any questions so far, I'm happy to take, and then I'm going to talk about these algorithms. I'm not going to introduce any new algorithm. Okay, so, so now I'm going to tell you why Thompson sampling is so popular. Uh, definitely one reason is that it's empirically usually, it, it empirically usually outperforms other algorithms. So this is a simulation that's, this is just synthetic data. So this is a one, 120 dimensional problem and you can see how these algorithms work. So. Awful seems to work well. This is like awful. Um, so greedy, first of all, just fails. In some cases, this huge variance comes from, um, you know, comes from this, this observation that greedy so sometimes works really well, but when there is an underestimation problem, it, it fails to find the optimal R. And so in, with, with some positive probability, it fails really bad. And that's why we, we see this, you know, kind of uh, wide confidence interval, uh, confidence band, band around, around uh, you know, it's, um, it's regret. Uh, Awful actually performs well, you know, on average, uh, and the variance is a small, but as you can see, Thompson sampling has a much smaller variance and it performs, you know, much better than the other ones in expectation. So it's empirical performance. It's definitely one reason that it's popular. And another, another reason that people use it is computational efficiency. So notice that in, in awful, you need to solve an argmax and supremum of something. And that can be hard to solve in some cases. So for example, if AT, if the action sets or polytopes represented as the intersection of uh, half spaces, then linear Thompson sampling basically requires solving a linear programming problem that is super easy to solve, but awful becomes actually NP hard. And so, you know, it's not even computationally tractable to awful, uh, to solve awful. And there's no computationally efficient algorithm known for this problem that achieves st optimal statistical uh, rates. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Uh, 
Um, okay, so now I'm going to uh, basically talk about the theoretical results that we already have about um, these algorithms. So we know, actually, Abbas Yotkuri et al. have shown, have shown that uh, OFUL satisfies this kind of regret bound. So the regret of OFUL is bounded by D square root T up to logarithmic terms. And in this, ter in this talk, I'm going to just ignore those logarithmic terms. But it says that for any theta star that is in the uh, unit ball, the regret of OFUL is bounded by D square root T. For Thompson sampling, we have a similar bound, but, but for the Bayesian regret. Notice that linear Thompson sampling is a Bayesian algorithm in nature because it assumes a prior distribution over, over theta star. And so in this result, uh, Rosso and Van Roy showed, showed that uh, the Bayesian regrets or the average regret of Thompson sampling is bounded by D squared root T. And there is a lower bound by Danny et al that, uh, that shows that basically this is optimal. So there is a Bayesian linear bandit problem uh, that no algorithm can, can get better than the square root on, on that you know, instant, problem instance. So it seems that everything is almost optimal, but there is a, but there is a, there is just one caveat here. And so, although this algorithm, linear Thompson sampling, is a Bayesian algorithm, but you can also look at this, you know, uh, look at its regret and see if you can, if we can prove something like this for, um, for Thompson sampling or not. The only thing that was known about Thompson sampling is that in the Gaussian case. If we multiply the covariance matrix of the posterior distribution or VT inverse by a number like beta squared, then we can prove something about this if beta squared is of order D. So there's a theorem by uh, Agraval and Abil, later on by, by other people like Abil, uh, that says that if beta is proportional to a square root D, then this regret is bounded by D square root DT. And so th there, is an, there is an additional square root D factor here. And the sad you know, uh, observation about this inflated version of Thompson sampling. So I'm going to call this inflated because we are, it's like we are inflating the posterior covariance matrix. So the, the problem with this approach is that now if we look at the, the, the empirical performance of this inflated or frequentist Thompson sampling, it suddenly becomes really, really bad, even worse than greedy. And so it's not, for practical purposes, this is not a uh, uh, you know, reasonable alternative to use instead of the actual linear Thompson sampling. So I'm going to pause here so that people can ask questions if they have any. Uh, hi, I had a question. Sure. Uh, so, uh, like, w why does the uh, performance of linear Thompson sampling become bad, uh, like, uh, on on multiplying the uh, this thing by the beta factor? I mean, is there like an intuitive reason? Here, you mean? In yeah. This case? Yeah, yeah. There is. Uh, the The main point is that. Um, so when you sample from this distribution with with this inf inflation, then it's like. When beta is like order of order square root D, then um, it's like too, you're not using your data as efficiently as you could have. Or in other words, you're over exploring the problem, right? Because, because um, the randomness in your theta tilt is way more, right? This is basically, this denotes, this shows how much randomness we have you know, in our theta, theta tilt. And this basically says that you, you're um, sampling from a um, much noisier distribution. And so your actions really don't use your data you know, that well. I hope, th does this make sense or? Yeah, it does, thanks. Okay, sure. Is there any questions? Okay. So uh, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to basically show s some results that we have um, that, that helps us prove you know, regret bounds for these algorithms, either Bayesian regret bounds or, or just, just um, worst case regret bounds. 
And so this is not about uh, any of those algorithms specifically. This is just like a general um, framework. So I'm going to uh, introduce a notion called worth function. And so by a worth function, I mean a function that assigns a value or a, you know worth to each action in the action set with the additional condition that it, that it should um, Take, take on values inside those confidence intervals that, that I have shown before. Actually, this, this, this just need to, uh, needs to hold with high probability. So, so basically, basically the idea behind the worth function is that you assign a number to each, to each of your actions, but, and it can be arbitrary. You can do it in, in whatever way you want. Uh, but the only thing is that you just need to make sure that with high probability, those numbers need to be inside the confidence intervals for, for each action at the same time. And so, and now we can define a algorithm that I'm going to call randomized OFUL. And uh, sorry, before, before I talk about that, this function can be deterministic or can be a stochastic. And this function is also a, I mean, this is, this, this is a function of your current action, each, each of your actions, as well as the entire history. So if you, um, so basically this is a function of a lot of things, but uh, I, I'm going to only um, write, you know, A here, and I'm not going to talk to write all the history you know, and all those things here because I just don't want it to get like uh, long and dirty. So um, now I'm going to talk to introduce a, another algorithm called randomized OFUL. So this is a generalization of OFUL. And in this algorithm, what, what, what we're doing is that instead of uh, maximizing those things that we have seen before, I'm, I'm just saying that just maximize your, your worth function. So assume that you have a function that assigns a worth to each of your actions, and then choose the action that has highest worth. And now it's easy to see that all the algorithms that I have talked about are special cases of this algorithm because you can just define uh, the worth function for greedy to be the inner product of A and the center of your ellipsoid. For awful, it can be the center of ellipsoid plus the width of the confidence interval. And for linear Thompson sampling, it can be A, the inner product of A and your sample from the posterior distribution, right? And of course, with, with this, you know, notion we cannot prove anything useful about raw food because uh, because you know if we, if we could if we could prove something about it then that would also give us some bound for greedy and we know that greedy doesn't work well so we need additional conditions and so that additional condition I'm going to call uh, call that optim optimism so this is a like a probabilistic optimism and so the only thing that we 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 require this. Um, um, worth function to have is that we want this supremum, the supremum worth that it assigns to different actions to be bigger than we call the actual, you know, supremum of A and theta star with some probability P. This is just an informal definition. The actual, uh, the, the formal definition requires a little bit of more care, but this is the, the gist of it. And so, and, and we don't need to, we don't need this to hold with probability one. We just need this to hold with some some positive probability. And then we can show that if we have an algorithm, if we have a uh, worth function that is optimistic, then the regret of rowful, the worst case regret of rowful, is bounded by this quantity. So. Uh, let me just go back, you know, like two slides. And so this is rho or the radius of the, conf the, the width of the confidence intervals. And so this is that rho. And we get the rho a square root of dt divided by p. And in most cases, we will see that p is like um, 0.5 or some fixed number. And rho is of order square root d. And so we get a d square root t bound. So this is like a... a the sharpest thing that you can you can expect. So for greedy, you can see that this optimism actually doesn't hold, and so or in other words, p is either super small or, or or zero, and so this bound becomes trivial. But we can show that for other algorithms like linear Thompson sampling or um, awful, this is actually uh, p is like 0.5 or some constant, and so you get a d square root t. So be, before I just uh, Go, for, go forward, for example, uh, you can see that why Thompson sampling works well in the Bayesian case. 
because the distribution of this guy by definition is the same as the, dist the distribution of this guy conditional on the past because Thompson sampling samples theta tilt from the posterior distribution and, and posterior distribution of theta star. And so by definition, these two uh, supremums have the same distribution. And so there is a probability 0.5 that this guy is bigger than or equal to the other one. And so this algorithm basically gives us very near optimal bounds. Okay, now I'm going to uh, now I'm going to talk about why this this idea uh, doesn't work. I had a quick question. Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, like I didn't really understand like why it should be a supremum there. Like, um, should like shouldn't it be for all actions or or does it come out to be the same thing? Like, actually, no, no, it's the, okay. So. Uh, the alternative that you're you're uh, proposing is actually uh, a stronger you know requirement. Okay. Okay. But we just we just want to make sure that if there is an there is an action that achieves like I don't know a reward of like five, we also assign we also assign a worth of five or above to at least one of the actions, but we don't care about all the other actions. So it's perfectly fine if you underestimate all the other actions. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your question. It's a very good question. Um, okay, now I'm going to, um, so I'm going to try to use this idea to see why Thompson sampling, why we cannot prove something like a D-square root T band for Thompson sampling in the worst case. So again, recall that the worth function for Thompson sampling is given by this formula, right? And then now we can decompose this MT of A for any A into the following three terms. So this term basically, okay, so it, it's, it's easy to see that why this is equal to that because this minus theta hat and theta hat cancel out and this minus theta star and theta star cancel out. And so you just get A and, and theta, theta, theta teal. However, this is an interesting uh, way of interesting decomposition because this is your actual reward. And this part comes from your, basically your estimation error. And this part comes from your uh, randomness in your theta, theta tilt, or this is like the, the, your mechanism to compensate. I'm going to talk about that uh, in a second. So first of all, it's easy to see that the supremum of M, M tilt T minus supremum of this inner product is bigger than or equal to M tilde of A star, and A star is the optimal arm. So A star is basically the, the action that, um, it's, it's the org max of this basically. And then uh, minus this. And why is that? Because as I, as I just mentioned, this guy is equal to this, this guy by definition because A star is the, is the org max of this. And here, this is just one of the one of the points that inside this supremum, and so definitely this supremum is bigger than or equal to that. So this is like uh, a very important inequality, but but it's also like kind of trivial. And now we can use this decomposition for a star a star t to see what we get. The nice thing is that when we put a star in this uh, in this formula, then we get a a star and theta star here, which will cancel out with this a star and theta star here, and so we will have these two, uh, you know, these two terms. Now, before I move, uh, you know, forward, just let me go back to the previous slide and then show that. Okay, so optimism means that we want this supremum to be bigger than or equal to this supremum, or in other words, the difference between these two, we want this, the difference between these two to be positive. And now I'm looking at the difference between these two and, and so a sufficient condition for, for that optimism to hold is that uh, we, we can expect this to, I mean, we, can, we, can, we, need, we need this to be positive, right? Or in other words, we can, we need this one to be positive, right? And so again, this is, this is the term that is <clears throat> caused by the estimation error. And so this can be negative in fact, but the main role of the, this theta tilt is to add some randomness in the problem so that this quantity becomes positive with some positive probability. So I'm going to 
call this term compensation term. And so if, we, if I define er, the you know, error vector to be the difference between theta star and theta, theta hat, and if we define the compensator vector to be the difference between theta tilt and theta hat, it's easy to see that <clears throat> um, basically this condition, this being bigger than or equal to zero is equivalent to saying that a, a star t, the inner product of the optimal action and c is bigger than or equal, bigger than or equal to the inner product of a star and e. So the only thing that we need to make sure is that um, we, we need to make sure that uh, the, uh, the inner product of uh, the optimal action and, and the compensator is bigger than or equal to the inner product of the, 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 the optimal action and, and the error vector. And it's easy to see that in the Gaussian case, both of these vectors follow normal zero and um, Vt inverse. And so again, it's easy to see that. Actually, this is not exactly true in the, in the Bayesian setting, but this is, all, this is certainly true for C, but for E, it's a little bit difficult because A star will also depend on E, but, but it doesn't matter. You can just ignore it. But there will be a positive, a probability like 0.5 that, that this holds. Okay, now I'm going to show an example in which Thompson sampling fails. So here I'm, I'm going to use an omniscient adversary. So basically the main point is that we need to define a sequence of action sets and we need to show that Thompson sampling fails if we show that sequence of action sets to the Thompson sampling. In this case, I'm going to, this, these action sets will be uh, basically constructed with an omniscient adversary that knows everything about the problem. So, the, the adversary can choose the action sets in an, in an adaptive way by, by observing what the data is and what the actual theta star is. And this slide is very informal. Don't worry about the details. I'm not, and this is not important because in the next slide, I'm going to talk about oblivious adversary that doesn't need to even look at the data. So, but I just, the main intuition comes from this slide. So the idea is as follows. Assume that the adversary shows an action set with only two elements to your, to your algorithm, to Thompson sampling. One, one action is zero and another action is A. And, and, and assume that A is the optimal action or in other words, the inner product of A and theta star is bigger than zero, right? So in this case, we expect, you know, like Thompson sampling to choose A at least with some positive probability, right? And for simplicity, assume that VT, VT is basically like the identity matrix and A is like, uh, has units, has, has norm one. This is not, you can just rescale it. This is not an important thing. And in, in the examples that we actually have, this is not true. I mean, VT is not equal to I, but it's a, it's a diagonal matrix whose entries are either one over two or one over three. So it's not like super different than this scenario. But in this case, it's easy to see that the inner product of A and C, because the norm of A is one and VT inverse is I, the, this inner product is normal zero one, right? Now, the point is that if we, if we know A, E, then we can construct E in a way that the inner product of A and E is bigger than a constant you know, fraction of norm of E. And notice that when E is sampled from normal zero I, the norm of E is of order square root D, right? And so, and, and now the point is that if, if the norm of this guy is of order square root D, the probability that your compensation term exceeds this guy is bounded by a super small probability. So this is, this, this is like a smaller than or equal to this, this, this like X power minus D. And so what this means is that your, your compensator is not strong enough to overcome the underestimation in, in this case, right? And because of that, there is a very, very small probability that your algorithm actually uh, chooses, chooses this, this, this R of A. 
And so between these two actions, zero and A, then your Thomson sampling will choose zero with high probability because A sounds very off. And then, yeah, so, uh, okay, before I, before I get to that point. And so, and then it chooses zero. And the, and the problem is that zero has no information. You, you, you learn nothing about your Teto star. And so your adversary can again show the same action set to your algorithm again. And so, um, and so basically that can, that can happen for, for an exponentially long time. So is there any questions in the audience? Uh, okay, now I'm going to, to tell you how this, so, uh, so far I haven't said how this A is constructed. So I'm just going to give a little bit of intuition about that. So let A be like a, you know, some constant times theta hat plus E. So notice that an, om an omniscient adversary knows theta hat and knows E by, by definition, right? And so basically it can lo look at, you know, the, the line that is, you know, uh, that passes through, for example, E and theta, theta hat, and, and, it, and, it, and it can choose C so that all of these requirements happen, you know, so it can basically choose C so that this is positive and uh, this inner product you know, is bigger than or equal to one over two times norm of E. And, um, and so again, linear Thompson's, it, you can construct it in a way that linear Thompson sampling chooses the optimal arm with an exponentially small uh, probability, you know, in, in terms of E. And so, yeah, a, again, as I said before, um, so this A tilde will be zero bit high probability, which, which carries no information. And so you can show the same action set you know, to your algorithm in the next round. And this will in cause your algorithm to incur a regret in the next round as well. And you can continue this process for, for an exponentially long time. And so just, just to see that how this A need, you know, can be defined. Now assume that this is your theta star and this is your theta hat. So this is your actual vector, the vector of true parameters, and this is your theta hat. And so this vector is your error vector. So you just want to define your optimal action A so that it has a positive uh, inner product with theta star and, the, and a big negative inner product with theta hat. Because this positive inner product ensures that your action A is actually the optimal action. And this negative uh, inner product between A and theta hat is uh, basically makes sure that you won't choose action A right, with high probability. And so, and for example, in this case, you can see how this can be done. And notice that this is like a two-dimensional problem. No matter in what dimension you are, this is a two-dimensional problem that you need to solve. And, uh, but this vector, you know, this blue vector compensator uh, C is in a very high dimensional problem. And so the inner product of this theta hat, this, this, com uh, this compensator vector and A basically gets smaller and smaller as the dimension um, goes. So now I'm going to uh, basically just briefly present my, my main result. Um, the main, okay, so, so, so far, there is no mismatch between the, the distribution that Thomson sampling <coughs> assumes and the environment. But what is causing Thompson sampling to fail is that we are, we are adding and we are letting an omniscient adversary to choose the action set, which, which is a very strong you know, kind of adversary. Now I'm going to relax this and I'm going to just give some intuition about how we can uh, relax that assumption. So if we have distributional mismatch, so if, for example, there is a prior distribution and noise distribution, but Thomson sampling uses another prior distribution and noise distribution to compute the posterior sampling, an oblivious adversary can also hurt Thomson sampling because the main ingredient of our counter example is knowing E. Because if you know E, then you can align your optimal action to be directed in the same direction as E, and that, co that, that causes Thomson sampling to fail. And the main point is that even by, by slightly modifying the noise distributions, the expected value of E will be, will be uh, non-zero. So just I'm going to go back a, you know, a few slides. So notice that here we said that E 
basically follows normal zero and some quantity. And this is because, you know, like the error vector, um, base, this is just because, you know, in, in our computations, the, the prior distribution and the noise distribution is the same in the environment as well as in our calculations. But if, if these two notions don't match, then the mean of E won't be zero. And an oblivious adversary can basically, can, can use that to construct action sets, you know, to deceive Thompson sampling. And this, the surprising fact is that even reducing the noise variance will also uh, hurt Thompson sampling. So just, just to uh, summarize, um, this is the result that we have. We show that there exists a Bayesian linear bandit problem such that the Bayesian regret of Thompson sampling grows linearly in terms of T for T exponentially large in terms of D. And this may seem kind of like um, in contradiction with the result that I, show, that I showed before, but this is not the case because um, the result that uh, Rosso and Van Roy, you know, uh, have, have, have uh, uh, proved, they use the prior distribution and the noise distributions in two different ways. One is that they use those things in the computation of posterior distribution inside linear Thompson sampling. And another use of that is that they use that to compute the Bayesian regret. So when you want to compute your regret or you want to define your regret, you need to uh, take some expectations and those expectations are with, this, with respect to the same prior distribution and noise distributions. Now, if these two notions don't match with each other, then we, sh we, sh we can show that the Bayesian regret of Thompson sampling grows linearly. And, and just, I just want to highlight, I don't want to go into details about how this counterexample works, but this is just a highlight of um, about uh, you know, some interesting aspects of our uh, counterexample. So basically in, in our counterexample, um, we actually, this is a Bayesian problem. So we, uh, we assume that theta star is, is sampled from normal zero and I. And Thompson sampling knows the, the, the right prior. So Thompson sample, there is no mismatch here. But linear Thompson sampling assumes that the data has a noise that, that, that follows standard normal distribution. But we actually show noise less data to, 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 to the algorithm. So instead of adding some plus some noise here, we just show noise less data to the algorithm. And in this case, Thompson sampling gets a linear regret. So the main point here is that it's not, so for many algorithms, you expect that, okay, if my, uh, if the true variance is like one, but if I set the true variance in my algorithm like two, my algorithm will be like overly cautious, but it's not gonna hurt it. But for Thompson sampling, this is not the case. So if you, even if you enter, you, you use a bigger, you know, uh, noise variance as a uh, hyperparameter, then that can ca cause Thompson sampling to fail in the worst case. Okay, now I'm actually going to pause here so that people can, can ask questions. Oh yeah, I, I just wanted an intuitive sense of like how common this counter example is like in uh, like practical problems where um, like, like multi-arm bandits are used. That's a very good question. So first of all, for the for multi-arm bandit problems, this problem doesn't exist because whenever you have some orthogonal actions, then mm -hmm. this problem doesn't arise in those cases. But this only happens for linear bandit. Okay. Uh, in my view, th these examples are not realistic at all. And actually we have some positive results and we show that in some cases, you don't need an inflation of order D. So even any, an inflation of like order some logarithmic terms in terms of D and T is enough. And the main ingredient in those cases is that you just want to make sure that your optimal action is in a random direction. It's not like aligned with any specific direction. So if you look at this example, the optimal arm is aligned with your error vector. But if you assume that your action sets are random and your, uh, your optimal action is in a random direction, then you can actually improve that. And in many real world applications that I can think of, like in, con in the contextual bandit, where the, action, where, where the actions uh, are like some characteristics about the user of your website or stuff like that, then that is a, ran a purely you know, kind of random vector. And it makes sense to assume that it's not aligned with your error vector. And so in those cases, Thompson sampling is fine. 
But the main message here is that it's important to understand why Thompson sampling is working. You know, it's not just because of those Bayesian results. It's also it has also something to do with the nature of your problem and your action set, action set stuff like that. Got it. Thanks. Sure. Is there any other questions? Okay, so I'm just going to, um, yeah, briefly talk about this. Um, so, okay, now, okay, now this is the end of my uh, third part, which was about the failure of Thompson sampling. So I'm going to briefly talk about the, the positive results that we have. So the main idea is as is as as I just described. So this inner product can be as big as. Uh, basically the, the, the multiplication of norm of this and norm of this uh, by, because of Cauchy Schwartz. And in the Bayesian case, in the true Bayesian case, when we know the right distributions, basically this guy is almost like independent of A star in many cases. And so this, this is going to be as much smaller than what Cauchy Schwartz give, you know, um, gives us. And, um, and so the compensator, the compensation vector can easily exceed this quantity with no problem. But in the worst case scenario, uh, I'm going to introduce another you know, condition and that condition is like, um, actually, let me just, just show you the, um, yeah, okay. So this is, this is the condition that I'm going to introduce. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume that A star T is in a, or your optimal R is in a random direction with, 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 with some uh, in distribution. So it's in, it's in a random direction in distribution. And then you can see that Thompson sampling almost works in this case. And so by being uh, in a random direction, I mean, I mean that there is, a, there is a parameter nu that's such that this happens with probability like one over you know, T cubed. So basically what I'm saying is that the probability that the inner product of your optimal action with any given vector being, um, being large is basically, uh, is, is a small. And so, and this new is a, a parameter that will appear in the amount of infl inflation needed. So in some cases you need to actually define new to be a square root D in the worst case. But in many other cases, like when A star is like sampled from some uh, sample uniformly, you know, inside the unit ball, then this, this is going to be much smaller than that. And so this is the main ingredient. And let me just, there is one other element that, I, that is just, it's just too technical to talk about. I'm, I'm going to skip that. But this is the main, you know, kind of, uh, this is the main theorem that we have that for Thompson sampling, uh, the re its regret is bounded by this quantity. Notice that here we have a beta and this is our inf inflation parameter. But this inflation now depends on some other parameters inside the model. And so this rho over square root d is basically like of order one. But this quantity basically that's, that um, diversity parameter appears here. And in the cases that the, this quantity is like much smaller than a square root d, then you get a sharper bound than d square root dt. Okay, so this is, I'm going to pause here. I don't wanna touch longer than this so that if people want to discuss anything further, um, uh, yeah, so we can, we can, we can talk, about, talk about those things. So just, just to summarize, I have pr proved that linear Thompson sampling without inflation can fail sometimes. And I also provided some conditions like diversity that's under which you can uh, basically com come up with similar guarantees for Thompson sampling. Okay, now I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, but before we move to questions, let's all unmute ourselves and thank the speaker. So much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, so we have some time for questions. Uh, anyone can feel free to um, unmute yourself and ask the question. And yeah, I just wanted to point out that um, in, in case you want to have a longer discussion with Nima, we also have a few slots for meeting him one-to-one. One -one. So yeah, you could, you could also sign up for that alternatively. Okay. 
Uh, thank you so much, Nima. I guess you have a 15 minute break now. And uh, me, who's in the talk right now, um, uh, you'll be meeting with her um, in the other Zoom room. Uh, sure. Does that sound, uh, uh, me, is that, is that okay with you? I'm sure she'll be uh, Yeah, sure, it's okay with me. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for visiting. Sure. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. It was my pleasure. And, and let us know if we can help with any other like um, logistics or anything. Okay, sure. Sure. So I will join the other meeting, right? Yeah, at, at I think 1.30. That's oh, right. with me. Yeah. 30 okay. minute break. Thank you so much, Greg. It was nice to yeah. see you all. Bye. Okay, okay. bye. Take care.